Um, okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'm Wahid Bimji. Uh, I currently lead uh, the Data and AI Services Group. Uh, and until recently, I was the interim uh, data department head as well. But now Debbie Bard has taken that over. So she'll be talking tomorrow morning as well um, at NERSC, obviously. Um, so people online, please let me know if you can't hear me and any speakers in the room, you should stand very still here and talk at this mic. Um, and there are there are um, mics in the ceiling as well for audience questions and so forth. But again, they're not amazing. So again, people online, please pipe up. I might not see the chat, but you can maybe see the chat if, if there's any problems uh, hearing. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick introduction to kind of data services at NERSC and also maybe look a little bit forward as to like kind of what is the direction we see for the data services and how we intend to evolve at NERSC. Okay. Uh, so why are we here at all? Uh, so we're here kind of to do science most part and a very simplified view of science is, uh, and I know this isn't all that science is, but is to take data from experiments and observations apply large amounts of computing from that, and so uncover secrets of the universe. Um, but actually, I would argue that data management is kind of critical to this process. And in fact, uh, there's many aspects you can put. You can begin them all with A's if you really want to. Um, but in all of these aspects, there's many opportunities to lose valuable science um, through poor data management or data processing. Um, for example, inefficient filtering or what we call triggers at the Large Hadron Collider, for example, uh, where you cannot collect the volume of data that's actually being recorded by the instrument. So you need to throw some away and how you do that is critical. Um, just like the limits of your storage capacity can often implement, uh, you know, restrict the science that you can do, uh, poor data quality, uh, the need for human steering of experiments. Uh, then when you actually have some data and you want to transfer them to a large supercomputing center, for example, you know, inability to transfer the data at the volumes that you have or manage the data to actually know what you're doing. Uh, then when you're actually processing the data, there's limitations in current users' interfaces. There's various software that might be difficult to use or unproductive, and we'll see how that links with data later on. You know, obviously, I.O. bottlenecks as well can affect processing. Uh, and then moving more into AI and analysis, um, you know, the the potential for AI to improve analysis techniques, I think, is really transformational. And, and this is why, because of the lost science. Uh, and then, you know, which probably shouldn't be left to the end, but when it comes to actually, you know, kind of... Uh, saving things for posterity or allowing for reproducible or reusable data analysis. Uh, that's somewhere where there's really a lot of limitation in the in the tools we currently have. Um, so at NERSC, we provide, um, you know, a lot of things to help with this. One is uh, very rich data systems. Um, so, you know, you're probably all aware that we have downstairs. If some of you hadn't seen it, you're welcome to come on a tour sometime. Uh, the very large, uh, mostly GPU accelerated system with over 7,000 A100 GPUs. Uh, but we also have a lot of data infrastructure as well. And you'll hear about this a little bit in the talks that we have. We have uh, file systems, both high performance file systems connected to the uh, su supercomputing itself, but also large community file systems and tape archives and so forth. Uh, and then we have also over a terabit connection out into uh, ESNet and to other facilities. So that's also a real asset that we have beyond other data centers. Uh, and then we're already planning for our next machine, Nurse 10. I'll talk a little bit about that. And Debbie Bard tomorrow in the first session, we'll talk about it more. Uh, and then we have these, uh, you know, container and edge services uh, provided by the SPIN service, which allows us to produce, you know, provide other kind of uh, on-demand data services as well. So we have a lot of data systems. We also have a lot of software. Uh, and so there's a broad range of software that we support that can kind of fit into different buckets. I kind of mentioned the areas already, data transfer, data management, analytics, uh, AI and machine learning, and so forth. Um, so another way of visualizing these is in terms of the kind of workflow, if you like. Uh, so this, uh, a while ago, uh, there was a blog that I and others wrote 
uh, that I've, you know, slowly these services have evolved, but many of them are science specific and some of them increasingly have a much wider, uh, you know, ecosystem, including Kubernetes, for example, and container technology where, um, you know, you'll hear in the next talk about how we've modified this for HPC use, but again, has a much wider uptake and allows us to benefit from a larger community. Uh, so another way of looking at this is how it maps, how the uh, how this all maps to a workflow. And so this was created, this, this figure was created at the time we were planning for uh, Nurse 9, which is Perma to the system we have on board, really showing how uh, the data ecosystem touches on all aspects of the system we have. So it makes heavy use of networking connections. It uses both CPU and GPU nodes for machine learning or for traditional analytics. Uh, heavy use of the file systems, and this is all driven with a kind of workflow integration piece as well. Uh, now, in terms of directions, which was the main point of this uh, this first talk, um, you know, we really see at NERSC a move from these kind of separate categories. So traditionally, even before the, the Cori system that we had before Permata, the current system on the floor, uh, really, the bulk of the workload was around simulation and modeling, although we did have also support for experimental science then. Um, certainly since then, we've seen a growth in the experimental data analysis part, and we've also seen the emergence of AI. Uh, but these have been like kind of separate workloads really carried on in isolation. Uh, what we see looking forward to the next machine, Nurse 10, is really the coming together of these and a kind of Venn diagram overlap as well as interaction between all of these. Uh, and it's all driven by kind of workflow software, uh, as well as needing components of simulation running alongside AI. Um, and then as well as this coming together, there's also a kind of extending of workflows beyond the system. Uh, so this is, you know, probably some of you have seen this slide. This is really what we're considering for Nurse 10, that not only is the architecture just a compute system or a compute system plus these ancillary services that I showed, but really extending out into the, the wider world and making all of this like uh, portable and programmable and orchestratable um, in a secure way. Um, but then it not just can, it's not just us, us as a system extending into the wider world. There's also this vision more broadly in DOE of an integrated research infrastructure. Uh, and this is really now heavily being pushed and moving from uh, Department of Energy and NERSC is a real uh, big player in this and Debbie Bard will talk about this in tomorrow's session and really a lot of tomorrow's session is about this kind of infrastructure um, and so this is really connecting together uh, compute facilities across uh, the Department of Energy so us as well as Argonne and Oak Ridge for example with uh, experimental science and also potentially with edge sensors, local com cluster computing, cloud computing, and so forth. Um, and so all of this is kind of built into the directions that we see, uh, and it can all benefit in terms of saving the science. So <laughs> this is kind of like a, a future goal, if you like, where science would be enabled by all of these ability to transfer data at extremely low latency directly into supercomputing centers from experiments, that you'd be able to build composable, uh, reusable kind of workflows, um, that your data would be like discoverable and also quite granularly accessible, um, that human interfaces, you, you know, uh, well, <laughs> you, there's various better ways that you could interact with um, computers than we currently do and, you know, also be allow you to leverage kind of uh, AI tools in a, in a kind of richer way that exploited the full um, kind of scientific models that we have. So there's a lot of techniques that need to be developed, but a lot of interfaces as well. And, and then finally, also being able to like uh, manage this data and curate it in a smart way. Okay, so some kind of example projects that we're we're undertaking along these lines. So one thing we see the you know we've been heavily involved in AI for science, and we'll have a, a series of talks about AI for science capabilities here. But we also have a lot of joint projects with scientists, um, and I think we see a move here towards more multi-purpose foundation models, as have been successful in large language modeling, for example, uh, but tailored towards science. 
Um, we also see a need for providing platforms on top of scientific AI. So this is actually, okay, you have foundation models, but how do you actually use them? So we have projects along that line. Um, then more on the workflow side, uh, we see a kind of convergence of HPC and cloud. And uh, so the, there's this uh, vision that you might hear about in the next talk of containers everywhere, like really being able to containerize a lot of our workload, which allows for more flexibility. As well as running kind of the traditional Slurm batch system alongside Kubernetes. So this is actually just a talk from ScaleMD who provide Slurm, but we're also kind of looking into investigating this. Um, and then in terms of analytics, you, you'll hear about various tools today um, that allow for using productive software such as Python and Julia uh, at large scale on HPC resources. Um, and then another important area is actually providing kind of fair data services to be able to curate and manage and uh, transfer and find your data. Um, so this is kind of calling out some of these um, areas in a different way again. Um, but then I just wanted to point out that all of this is maps kind of just to bring it back to reality to the kind of program we have for the next two days. Um, so we have a series of talks at the start that really I think about kind of composing services and compute seamlessly. Uh, so containers and, and applications of containers. Um, then we have tools about allowing you to experiment with productive languages. So I mentioned distributed Python and, and Julia. Uh, then about leveraging AI models. So both about how to actually do AI training at scale, deep learning at scale. So we have a lot of experience there and we'll be sharing some of that. Oh, this may have the wrong speakers there, but <laughs> I didn't update it. Uh, and then uh, some kind of how this is being applied to science, but also how you can run this within workflows and actually build in inference to uh, data pipelines. Uh, and then tomorrow's session uh, really is about, um, well, I guess you could say it's also about composing across distributed facilities. So this vision of an integrated research infrastructure and what we've done uh, with the super facility API to make our supercomputer uh, programmable. Uh, and then we have also a bunch of external uh, collaborators and science teams talking um, about science projects that they've that they've uh, carried out at NERSC. Um, and then, you know, we have a lot of talks uh, sprinkled throughout that cover the idea of reusing data and, and transferring data. Nick will be talking about using Globus for that. And then we also have talks about from storage systems team about um, using the right storage. Um, and so one other thing I didn't mention is that, you know, initially when we were giving these data days, maybe uh, eight years ago or so, um, a lot of the work was actually within uh, my group, the DAS group. Uh, now we see that this is really spread across the center. So I think we have at least four, maybe five different groups speaking uh, this time. So I think that really shows how data data services has become kind of fundamental to all of um, what we do at NERSC. Okay, so that was kind of all I had. Uh, and so if there's any questions for me, I mean, I put up pictures of the speakers or at least the, the, the NERSC speakers uh, who are talking today, but there's many other nurse people here as well who can help with any questions. And we do want this, I think, to be an interactive session. So uh, please uh, raise any questions you have. I'll also be around at lunch as well if people have um, want to discuss any potential collaborations. Uh, and then I put, you know, if you want to provide answers instead of questions, I put a couple of questions there that you could, could help us um, determine what you do. So what we do in the next two days. So if you want to... Um, either comment on that now or post things in chat about things you're hoping to get out of this or would have liked to see on the agenda that we can either talk about later or, um, or um, you know, build into future events. Um, and then I don't know if Nick, I guess you didn't mention that we do, also, there is also uh, on Friday an office hours session that's been organized where if you do have additional comments or you need additional help, um, I think that will be all virtual, right? The office hours is virtual, but um, you know, feel free to sign up for a slot there as well. Okay, any questions? Thank you, Wiki.